kids are dismissed for junior church. Today's scripture reading will be found in Galatians 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from our God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. I am admi- amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. You may be seated. Good morning. Before I begin, I would like to say that it's my privilege this morning to bring the word of God to you. And I have two prayers this morning. The first one is that when you hear God's word, one, I would only preach what's from his word and that you would receive it and be changed by it. And then the second thing is that someone here that doesn't know Christ might come into a relationship with him and be changed. I want to begin our service with a question this morning. Do you remember the first time you left your children home alone? Now, I understand that not everyone here has children, and if you know how old my children are, I didn't leave them home alone yet, so, (laughs) yeah, so, um, just think about you as the child in the situation. When your parents are getting ready to leave you home alone, they usually leave the oldest child in charge, and they go through all the do's and don'ts that they have for you. Make sure you do your homework. Make sure if the house isn't clean that you clean it up. Make sure if you want to get something to eat, make sure you turn the oven off because I don't want my house burned down when I come back. And so make sure you don't fight with each other. So you go through all these do's and don'ts because you don't want your house destroyed when you get back. And after you go through all of them, I always remember, at least for my mother, telling me something that was very important, and this is what she said. Do not open the door to anyone that's knocking. And she's talking not your grandmom, not your aunt, not your cousin, no one. And then I always remember her taking a step further and saying, she would even say, even if I'm knocking on the door, don't open it. And the point she was trying to make is that she has a way to get in the door. If she needs to get in the door, she has keys that are able to open the door. And she's stressing the point of me not opening the door to anyone because she realizes there could be someone who could easily deceive you and come in and say, hey, it's the police, but it's really not. Or, hey, I'm your mom or dad, and they're really not. I believe this is similar to what Paul is saying inside our passage that we'll be going through today. There are people who have entered the church of Galatia, and they have distorted the gospel message. They've knocked on the door of the church, and believers have let them in and have let them deceive them. They're fakes and they're deceivers. So the main point I want to make as we go through our passage today is we need a higher view of the gospel because if we compromise the gospel, we no longer have the gospel. Let me say it again. We need a higher view of the gospel because if we compromise the gospel, 
we no longer have the gospel. I think no matter where we're at in our walk with the Lord, each of us need a higher view of the gospel. And I think if your view of the gospel is low, you're in danger. There's a reason as a kid now, once your parent gives you all these instructions, you make sure not to open that door. And it's because now you have a higher view of the danger that is outside of that door if you do open it. And I'm here to say that if we don't get this good news right, the gospel, if we add to it, if we take away from it, I think we weaken it and we're all doomed and we no longer have any good news to share. So let's start with who were the Galatians? The Galatians had multiple churches in the southern regions of Galatia, and they were made up of Jews and also non-Jews. And the Jews believed at the time that the Gentiles, in order to follow Jesus, first, they had to follow Torah. In this book, what we'll see is the difference between grace and law. The law condemns, grace redeems. The law says you need to do this and do that. Grace says it is finished. The law reveals our unrighteousness. Grace depends on Jesus Christ to be our righteousness. So we realize there's a huge issue when you mix law and grace together. And I think this is what many of the Jews were doing to believers at that time. And what's kind of interesting as I was studying this book is you'll realize as you read through Galatians that Paul never praises the Galatian churches like he does every other church. He'll open up his letter like, I thank you for this, this, and that. He doesn't do that with the Galatians, and I think this shows the seriousness, seriousness of the letter. Since this is about the gospel, I believe that it's about life or death. And I think uh, what the Jews didn't understand, I think a lot of people don't understand today, is that the law was never meant to get you to heaven. And so if you open up the book of Romans and just start reading it, you'll realize you get to a point where Paul says that Abraham was justified by faith, and it was never by works of the law. So let's go through what was happening in the book of Galatians. Paul's upset at the Galatians. If you read Galatians 1, he says, Oh, foolish Galatians. And he's upset because they let people come in and distort the gospel. So let's see exactly how the people of Galatia, well, the church of Galatia was distorting the gospel. In Galatians 2, 3-4, it says, But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, so that means he was a Gentile, he wasn't a Jew, was compelled to be circumcised, but it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spout our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. So we realized there was a clear problem going on where the people who came into the, Galatia, the churches of Galatia and they were telling them in order for them to be saved, they must get circumcised. And circumcision was a ceremony that was performed on males, and it was supposed to display the covenant between God and Abraham and his descendants. Now, we know this isn't a requirement for believers now, but I believe that the Jews wanted the church to believe that Christ's death and resurrection was not enough. And so they wanted the church to be bound to the law. And if you read through the book of Galatians, they were even creating problems between Paul and Peter, where Peter was acting one way around his Gentile brothers, but then he would act another way when those same uh, Gentiles were around Jews. So much so that Paul had to come and rebuke and confront Peter about his sin. So let's start with verse six. It says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. 
The first point I want to make in our passage today is if you turn to a different gospel, you no longer have the gospel. Let's just go over this word astonished really quickly. Paul was amazed. He was shocked. He was taken aback. I think for us from Philly, what's most appropriate to say is that he was dumbfounded. Um, Paul couldn't believe what they were letting go on inside the church. And I think we've all had these moments in our life when we were astonished, but not in a good way, at what was going on. Recently, I was on the internet watching uh, YouTube of the top 10 mishaps in the medical field. If you know, I work in the hospital. This kind of scared me, some of these. But there was a guy by the name of Donald Church. Donald went to get an operation done, and after two months of pain, he decided, all right, let me go back to the doctors. The doctors, after 30, second of, 30 seconds of the cat sand, asked him, Donald, do you have metal inside of you? Donald responded, not that I know of. He went home that day, and the surgeon called him and told him, I'm sorry to tell you this, Donald, but when we performed your surgery, we left an object inside of your body. Now, Donald, what, what's kind of sad about this story is he was getting surgery because he had cancer. And so Donald and his wife thought that his cancer had came back. So it kind of, you know, if you're home for two months, you probably think, oh, this surgery didn't work. Um, it's kind of a shame, the story. But what Donald wound up finding out when he got to the doctors is that they left a 13-inch stainless steel retractor in him. And so... For me, at least, when I'm watching this video, and this is something that still happens to people during surgery, how do you make a mistake like this? I was shocked and I was speechless that a trained medical professional can make such a serious error. And I think this is what Paul was feeling towards the Galatians. It was not long ago, if you start reading through the book of Acts, where Paul had actually proclaimed the gospel to the Galatians, and they were already distorting it and going to different Gospels. And I thought this was interesting. Um, the word astonished used here is actually in the Gospel 33 times, and guess what it's used for? It was a reaction from people to Jesus' miracles and teachings. And so I think this is just more insight on how much disbelief Paul was in towards the Galatians. So, why did Paul feel this way? Why was he, he in such belief towards the Galatians? And I think this leads into my second point. If you depend on works to, be, to save you, you no longer have the gospel. The Galatians were turning away from the true gospel to a fall, false one, and when he says that they were deserting those, when he says deserting those who called you in the grace of Christ, if you read through the book of Galatians, this is actually a theme in the entire book. And so there were Jews who stepped into the church, and there was one commentary that put it like this. They were grace killers. I love how Paul, when he's talking in this passage, he does not say, you're deserting me or you're, betray you're betraying me. He says you're betraying Christ. And even if you read through the book of Corinthians, Paul said, you know, they're so focused on, oh, Apollos, oh, Paul. And Paul's like, don't worry about what leader you're attached to. It's about Christ while we're here. So there's only one true gospel. And I think if you add anything to it, or if you take anything away from it, you distort it. So Paul explains the true gospel, I think, in Galatians 2.20. He says, it, he says this, The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So the true gospel is faith in Jesus' death and resurrection. I think sometimes for people, this is a hard pill for them to swallow. People hate that we can't earn God's righteousness or earn our way to heaven. And I think if you say to be saved, you must 
fill in the blank of anything you want to say. And it's anything but what Galatians 2.20 says of having faith in the Son of God who loved himself and gave himself for me. It's a distortion of the gospel. The grace of Christ is what saves us. The grace of Christ is how we are made righteous. The grace of Christ is the gospel, not works of the law. So if you're still trying to work for your salvation, you no longer have the gospel, but there's something you do have. You have a low view of the gospel. So not only were the Galatians deserting the grace of Jesus, they were also turning to another gospel. And I love how if you read verse 7, Paul kind of assures us, he says, turning to another gospel, he's like, which is really not another gospel. I love that he says that. This leads to my third point. If you have more than one gospel, you no longer have the gospel. Uh, Don Anderson put it like this. If I had two $1 bills, one real and one counterfeit, you could get the picture. They look alike if you have $2 bills. But there's one that is good and one that is not. The counterfeit lacks quality, authority, and usefulness. One is 100 cents versus nothing. There's similarity without reality. So people often say that in order to identify a fake, you have to meditate a lot on the truth. So if you know the truth well enough, it's easier to spot something that is fake. And I remember when I was working at CVS, especially around the holidays, you have so many people coming in with fake, uh, fake $100 bills, fake $20 bills, that you really have to train your cashiers. And you know, in retail, a lot of times, the, pe the people you hire are like the 16-year-olds that need nail money and stuff like that. So, like, they're not really looking to, hey, is this real, is this fake? And even, like, I was over Adriel's house, and, like, he has these $100 bills that I thought were real, and they weren't. And they got, like, the stripe on it. Everything is, like, just like the real dollar bills. But, there, anyway, the... When I was at CVS, she had brought us in the office, and we literally, she took all the shift leads and was like, guys, this is a fake one, and this is a real one. And we looked at it and seen, tried to see, hey, how is this different? And if you know um, money, you know if you lift the bill to the sky or into the light, you'll see a little head. I don't think the fake ones have that yet. I hope not. But uh, anyway... It's becoming harder as people are getting smarter creating this fake money. But I think this example fits well with our passage today because, because Paul's, like Paul said, it's not like there's another gospel. And so there's only one true gospel. And if you think about it, these false teachers in the churches were clever because it's not like they made a whole new gospel. They used Jesus' name and distorted the gospel to make what they were saying seem like the real thing. And let me just mention a few just religions of this time. Jehovah wit Jehovah's Witness, Mormonism, Catholicism, Prosperity Gospel, New Age Practices. A lot of these religions are using Jesus' name to distort the gospel. This is something that's common in our country. People use Jesus' name for their own good. So with this counterfeit and this distortion, Paul tells the Galatians they are disturbing you. So the Galatians are being troubled, and this false gospel is causing a lot of commotion within the church. And I don't know about you, but it kind of reminds me of that fly at the barbecue. It, there, it's a nice day out. You're enjoying company, you're enjoying music maybe, you're enjoying some good food, and there's just this one fly that just keeps buzzing back and just annoying you, landing on your food, buzzing in your ear, and it just agitates you, it stirs you up that this fly is bothering you. So I think the Jews in the church 
were being the flies. Uh, so let's go in, on to Paul into the next two verses. He even takes it further than that. He says in Galatians 1, 8 through 9, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to we have preached, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if many man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be accursed. And this is my fourth point. If, we, if you can be convinced to believe another gospel, you no longer have the gospel. And Paul kind of goes off into three different sections of even if we preach to you a contrary gospel, even if angels, and even if other men. So let's go over the we. If we go back to the analogy of a parent leaving a child at home for the first time, this would kind of be the moment where you exaggerate to stress you don't want your kid to open a door. You say, even if I knock on the door, and Paul says, even if we preach to you a different gospel, and I think this kind of lends to Paul's credibility and how serious he took the gospel. And there was a question that was on my mind that I needed to ask myself, and I think we need to ask ourselves as well, is would you still follow Christ, fill in the blank of any person you could think of, and would you still follow Christ if that person was telling you a different gospel? I mean, even if it's a person you look up to, even if it was a great person of faith, they were telling you a different gospel, would you still follow Christ? Paul says, even if we let us be accursed, and I think I should just mention that your faith in Christ should never be based on other people. I, I've seen leaders in the church fall, um, and people leave their faith because of that. I've seen people in our ch society with church hurt because someone they seen that was great now has left the faith and are telling them a different gospel. So Paul not only says we, but he says an angel from heaven. So let's go over angels. I think Paul, he's kind of using hyperbole to get his point across. I don't think he thinks an actual angel is going to come from heaven and preach to you a different gospel. I do think th this verse just popped up, and I think we should keep it in mind. It's 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14. It says, no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So the, true the truth of the gospel has been laid out for us, and it will not change. So if you reject it, then you are rejecting the one true gospel that God has revealed to us. And as I was studying this passage, I found this interesting, that some of the other major religions of the world are, began because they got a special revelation from an angel. So let's just go over two. In Mormonism, Moroni was a messenger sent by God to Joseph Smith. Moroni told Joseph that God had important work for him to do. Moroni also told Joseph that a book written in gold plates buried in the hillside contained the fullness of the gospel. So that's one example of an angel coming and telling a man about a different gospel. Also, if you look in Islam, Muhammad's first revelation was being visited by the angel Gabriel, who revealed to him the beginnings of what would later for us become the Quran. So it's kind of crazy that I think it seems like Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, knew that there would be false teachers. But also, he knew that their pitch would involve telling you an angel from heaven gave them a special revelation. And if you think about it, this has been very convincing for people because people have followed these other religions that are contrary to what is the true gospel. So I want to say again, if there is a person who can, who can convince you that there is a different gospel, 
We need a higher view of the gospel. So he goes over him, uh, we, he goes over angels, and then he talks about other men, or we could just think about other people. So he says, as we have said before, so I, I say again now, if any man is preaching you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be accursed. Now, it almost feels like if you're reading through this passage, like Paul is making the same point. He's repeating himself, and that just tells us how serious this gospel message is to him that he would say it yet again if any man is preaching to you a gospel that's contrary. But after studying this passage, the phrase we have said before is actually one word in Greek, which means to foretell, to predict, or to speak in advance. And as I looked it up, most commentators, and I think I agree with them here, who actually know the language, have said that Paul was not rever referring to verse 8 when he says, as we have said again, but he's actually referring to the previous trip he had made in Galatia. So if you read through um, Acts, you'll see the trip that he made to Galatia. And this makes sense because what he's basically doing is saying, hey, I was saying this before, and I'm still saying it now. And it kind of reminds me, this situation happens often. I'm sure you uh, people who have kids have had this similar experience where I'll be in the kitchen, I'll be cooking breakfast, and you hear a loud fall. You rush to the living room to see what was going on, and you see your kid on the floor crying, and you ask them, oh, are you standing on the couch and running around on the couch like I asked you not to? And they'll sit there and, yeah, daddy, I was. And it's like, I tell, I'll tell my child again, you know, I make sure you're all right, but I have to tell you again, please do not stand on the couch. And it's because we know that there is a danger if you stand and you run on this couch that you don't think is there. And so um, we'll warn her to stop standing on the couch because we know as parents, you will and you will fall and hurt yourself. So, um, so Paul is speaking of a prior visit that he made to the Galatians, and this makes sense, especially of in light of Galatians five. If you read it, verses nineteen through twenty-one, he goes over a list of sins as Paul sometimes does, and he says this of which I forewarn you, so he's telling them now, I'm warning you now, and just have, just as I have forewarned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So this isn't a new warning that Paul had gave to the Galatians. So Paul repeats this point, I think, um, because the gospel is essential to Christianity. And he knows that the Jews were adding to the gospel. And if you add to the gospel, you no longer are dealing with the actual gospel of Christ. So Paul goes over himself. He goes over angels. He goes over other men. And he explains how if they preach the gospel, that person, a different gospel, that person should be accursed. So Paul takes the gospel very seriously. And if you look, he uses this word accursed five times in the New Testament. And when he uses it, if you read through each one of those verses, he's talking about the essentials of the faith. Paul doesn't use the word a lot, but all the verses he uses the word accursed for are very serious. And to be accursed means to be condemned eternally to hell. So there are things in life that people don't play, out, play about. And for Paul, the gospel was one of those things. It was crucial to him, and he wasn't going to compromise, nor was he going to add because the, the grace of Christ was and is enough. So how should we take what we learn today, and how should it affect your life now? I've, Paul had a high view of the gospel. If you read through all his epistles, I've 
gotten the chance this year to just start reading through his epistles. And one of the most beautiful things you get to see is Paul is just laying out the gospel, talking about the gospel. I love the gospel. You'll just keep seeing that Jesus Christ's death meant so much to Paul. And I think as Christians, we need to have that same attitude as well. And if we don't, if we don't have the same view of the gospel, I think we'll be in trouble of distorting it, just as the Galatian church, or in danger of others coming into our life and distorting it. So I had to check myself because I actually found myself thinking, Paul, don't you think this is a little extreme? You're saying that these people should be condemned, but I think as I was thinking about that more, I was thinking, I think as Christians, we just need to have a higher view of the gospel. And so the gospel should be special to us. The gospel should change everything about us. We shouldn't go one day without thinking of God's goodness that he would send Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners. Let's, uh, in 1 Corinthians 1.17, it says, For Christ did not come, did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So Paul's mission was to reach as many people as he could, or as possible, with this good news. And I think my worry today for myself and just Christians inside the United States is I think that we get bored with the gospel. I think, and my desire is for all of us like Paul to have a high view of the gospel, to take the gospel seriously. I want us all to treasure it, to believe Christ is enough, and when he said on the cross, it's finished, he meant it. There's nothing we need to add. There's nothing we need to take away. And so this week, let's find joy and be amazed again that he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And let me just say this. You can have assurance of your salvation because it's not based on you and your works. Ephesians 2, 8-9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, so it's not because of you. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So I think as Christians, we need to rehearse the gospel to ourselves every day. We need to know it, we need to reject false gospels, and we need to remember the gospel is why we can be forever grateful. That God would love us so much that he would look at us as small creatures that we are, sinful creatures that, that, that we are, and that he would say, you know what, I'm going to send my son to die for you so that way we can restore this relationship if you have faith in his death and resurrection. So, again... We need a higher view of the gospel because if we compromise the gospel, we no longer have the gospel. And I would like to just say, if you're here this morning and you're an unbeliever, if you don't know Christ, if I didn't make it clear, I just want to make the gospel clear one more time. We're sinners that can't save ourselves. Jesus came to earth. He lived a perfect life. He died and he rose again. When you place your faith in him, not anything you do, not any works that you do, when you place your faith in this perfect life, death, and resurrection, he saves you. So let's not add to that message. Let's not take away from that message. And as believers, let's remember that it is finished. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that for all of us that know you here today, we are saved not on the basis of our works, but Lord, because your goodness and your kindness and your love for us. Lord, we pray that the gospel would be serious to us. We pray that 
we would not compromise the gospel in our everyday life. And Lord, that we will remember that the gospel is the power to save. And so that we would share your gospel throughout this week. And Lord, that we would rehearse it to ourselves so that way we can grow closer to you and grow in our love for you. We thank you so much, Father. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn in your hymns, Modern and Ancient, to number 112. You may not need it. You know it. The gospel song, but stand as we sing and close. We'll sing it through twice. 